Good morning, everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure to be with you here and with all of you that are joining us online to welcome you um, here to the Office of Justice Programs. Um, today's event, titled Community-Based Approaches to Juvenile Justice, was inspired by OJP's Office of the Assistant Attorney General and really um, inspired in many ways by the paper that hopefully you have in your hands um, that is jointly published by the National Institute of Justice and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, let me, of course, begin by thanking Assistant Attorney General Mason and everyone in her office, especially Brent, I don't know where you went, um, for obviously organizing today's event and for really continuing um, Assistant Attorney General Mason's commitment to support and advance juvenile justice in the country. Um, as director of NIJ, I thought I would take a few minutes to provide you with a little bit of background regarding our longstanding, um, truly longstanding collaboration um, between NIJ and Harvard University, um, which in many ways um, led to the production of this particular paper and many others that we feel have um, been so important in creating um, the national dialogue and narrative around issues of crime and justice. Um, so early um, in the 1980s, NIJ and Harvard partnered together to bring together forward-thinking police executives and researchers to discuss the current state of policing. The executive session, entitled Policing and Public Safety, explored issues um, around policing and crime control and produced several papers um, that we feel certainly revolutionized policing. So for example, one um, I think example that demonstrate this is the executive session actually created um, and, and the, the framing um, and shaping of community policing. Um, so again, certainly important work. Then again, in 2008, um, we collaborated on the second executive session on policing to examine the increasing challenges and complexities facing law enforcement in the 21st century. Sound familiar? Um, members of this distinguished um, panel um, discussed, for example, the role of technology in policing, police responses to mass demonstrations, terrorist events, police legitimacy and accountability, as well as the cost of policing in a struggling economy. They produce papers on issues like police discipline and professionalism, community relations and procedural justice, and the role of policing in reducing incarceration. Given the success of these executive sessions, then NIJ Director John Lobb, who is with us today, thought we could actually utilize this model to inform other areas in the criminal justice system, including the rapidly changing field of corrections. So three years ago, we partnered again um, with the Harvard Kennedy School and convened the executive session on community corrections to develop new ideas around criminal sanctions and the role of community corrections in supervising and working with those who come into contact with the justice system. During the sessions, which is some I attended, members critically and thoughtfully discussed a broad array of topics like collaborative models for community justice, developmentally appropriate responses to justice-involved young adults, the role of risk assessments in community corrections, and the development of a community corrections framework that has health and well-being of communities at its core. So today, we are so pleased to release the paper from this executive session entitled, The Future of Youth Justice, a Community-Based Alternative to the Youth Prison Model which builds on years of research in the areas of juvenile justice and community corrections, as well as the experiences of several states. But also importantly, it actually provides recommendations on, on actually creating the community-based alternatives. I have to say, personally, as a scholar who has written on juvenile court processes and juvenile outcomes, it is extremely exciting to have these leaders bring juvenile justice reform to the forefront. And I won't steal the limelight from two of the authors who you'll hear from shortly, but let me say the following. The paper nicely conveys, and strongly, I should add, that actually having community-based approaches and alternatives really does reduce recidivism, it controls costs, and promotes public safety. I'd like to think that the session, of course, allowed 
leaders in the field, in policy and research to come together and of course bring the scholarship to you. And I think it's a wonderful example of our commitment at NIJ to really inform the criminal justice profession with science. And I want to say that this commitment continues. Just this year alone, NIJ invested almost $158 million in research to advance our criminal justice system. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the areas that we support, um, it includes every aspect, I think, of our criminal justice system, from victimization, radicalization to violent extremism, human trafficking, school safety, forensic science, and every component within the criminal justice system. We should also know that we are thinking rather strategically about our investments here at NIJ, and just two months ago, actually, released our first strategic research plan on safety, health, and wellness. By the end of the year, you'll see our strategic plans in the area of policing and corrections and following. Early next year, you'll see it on Sentinel events or errors in criminal justice. To be clear, these strategic plans really are the way to address the needs of the criminal justice field. We feel that it is important to respond to the challenges and complexities that exist in our criminal justice system, and our research investments should certainly support those efforts. We are also very proud to leverage our strategic research investments in areas around delinquency and juvenile justice. And I would like to certainly acknowledge the ongoing scientific work of NIJ's sister agency, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, has undertaken in this important area. Since 1974, OJJDP has led the federal government in providing knowledge and assistance to state and local communities seeking to prevent delinquency and improve our juvenile justice system. They have also been a critical partner for us at NIJ in several areas, including gangs, school safety, bullying, and as you'll hear today, community corrections. Now I have the honor of introducing my dear friend and colleague, OJP, OJJDP Administrator Bob Liston Bay. I could have, I could have, I, I could spend the whole session actually saying many, many things about my dear friend, but let me just say the following, because I think um, this is important to say, given again the hat that I wear. Um, Bob is a true champion right, of children, youth, and families, and everyone who works within the juvenile justice system but he also leads with science, and that is vital. Um, every time I see him, he is referencing the National Academy's report on juvenile justice reform, and, then, and time and time and time again, I can't say that. And again, for me, it is tremendous. So for that, um, I thank you and many, many other things. Please join me in welcoming Administrator Uh, thank you very much, Nancy, for that very, very warm welcome. And thank you for the wonderful work that you do at the National Institute of Justice uh, to inform and improve our justice system. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us here at the Office of Justice Programs. As Nancy indicated, I'm the administrator of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. And it's just great to see so many people here who are interested in juvenile justice reform, and the timing could not be more perfect. Uh, this month, uh, President Obama proclaimed October 2016 as National Juvenile Justice Awareness Month. In that proclamation, the president noted, and I quote, as a society, we must strive to modernize our juvenile and criminal justice systems to hold youth accountable for their actions without consigning them to a life on the margins. Your interest, your focus, your research, and your actions can help young people move from the margins and become the center of stronger communities. And again, thank you so much for coming here to share your participation in this wonderful event. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity today to talk about our work at OJJDP, including the role that research plays in our planning and program development, and also our efforts to reduce the number of kids in out-of-home placement, uh, which has been one of my top priorities since coming to OJJDP. Congress has tasked OJJDP with two primary areas of responsibility. First, we work for positive outcomes for at-risk children and youth, 
and those who come to contact with the juvenile justice system. And at the same time, we work to protect youth in America who are victims of crime and violence. Both responsibilities come with their own unique challenges. We constantly ask ourselves how we as an office can improve our response to youth who commit offenses or who are victims of crime. To do this, our office has relied on a robust program of research to support and guide our efforts. The requirement that we sponsor and encourage research, evaluation, and data collection was part of the original authorizing legislation, the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act. And we anticipate our research responsibilities will only expand in the years to come. At OJJDP, we have a vision that guides our work. We envision a nation where our children are healthy, educated, and free from violence. And if they come into contact with the juvenile justice system, that contact should be rare, fair, and beneficial. And I'll discuss this in greater detail as I go on. To bring this vision to life, we focus on narrowing the entry points to the juvenile justice system, narrowing that front door, and protecting those youth who do enter it. Supporting juvenile justice reform and reducing out-of-home placement are key to these efforts. Our juvenile justice system must strive to reclaim young lives rather than simply punishing them. For this reason, we encourage states and communities to adopt reforms that incorporate developmentally appropriate, trauma-informed, and evidence-based policies and practices that promote healing. Let me emphasize that, that promote healing, not just punishment, not just rehabilitation, but healing and other positive outcomes for children. Research suggests that this approach, rather than a strictly punitive-based approach, is the best way to reduce future offending and promote public safety. Our primary intent is to keep kids from entering the juvenile justice system in the first place. To that end, OJJDP funds a number of prevention programs, including a robust mentoring portfolio to help kids engage or re-engage with positive and caring adults. In order to maximize our impact, many of our programs target to historically underserved children, children of incarcerated parents, disabled youth, LGBTQ youth, gang-involved youth, victims of sex trafficking, and girls involved with the juvenile justice system. In those instances where a young person does touch the justice system, we strive to keep them from penetrating any deeper in the system than is necessary. This is critically important because the research tells us that too much contact between the justice system and a low-risk young person can actually result in worse outcomes. And to that end, we encourage the use of diversion programs to keep kids from entering the front door of the courthouse and when necessary, uh, getting them the community-based services and treatment they need. We also uh, seek to ensure that every child has access to quality legal counsel at every stage of the court process. As a former juvenile defender for many years, I know how critical this work is. And I know that despite our best efforts, too many young people show up in court without adequate legal counsel. And for kids who penetrate deeper into the system, we also pursue reforms uh, to juvenile probation and juvenile corrections, including eliminating solitary confinement in juvenile justice facilities. Our Smarter on Juvenile Justice Initiative, which, is, which was highlighted in the President's proclamation, is representative of the support we offer states that are ready for reform. We provide technical assistance to help Smart on Juvenile Justice states implement recently passed legislative reforms, reduce juvenile detention and confinement and racial and ethnic disparities, and reinvest savings in community-based services. And often the savings are enormous. When children go into facilities that cost as much as $260,000 a year per child for secure confinement, if we can reduce those numbers, we can have dramatic savings as many of our states, New York, California, Hawaii, and others have shown. We're also working to institute reentry services and help youth successfully navigate a return to their communities. When they arrive home, and to be clear, almost every young person in a juvenile justice facility will one day return home. We want to make sure that they have every opportunity for success, and that means making community services more accessible and helping them mitigate the collateral consequences of juvenile records through expungement and other statutorily allowed mechanisms. We are beginning to see results. Reports from the Smarter Juvenile Justice States indicate that their detention and confinement populations 
are shrinking, and other reforms are beginning to take root, and crimes committed by youth continue to go down. Sustaining these efforts will require the support of local stakeholders, federal partners, and legislators. The reforms I just mentioned are elements of a de developmental and trauma-informed approach to juvenile justice. We are deeply committed to this approach because we know from our funded research that the vast majority of children in our juvenile justice system have been exposed to past trauma. The OJJDP-sponsored Northwestern Juvenile Project, a longitudinal study of detained youth in the Midwest, revealed that more than 90% of the youth had experienced at least one traumatic event, and more than half were exposed to violence six or more times. Indeed, children who are exposed to violence are more likely to fail in school, to suffer mental health and substance abuse disorders, experience serious medical problems, become future victims of violence, and yes, become involved in the juvenile and criminal justice systems. While significant progress has been made, we also must acknowledge that significant work remains. I believe that work must start with research. We support research and we use it to inform our programs and policies, and we encourage our stakeholders to do the same. From the Northwestern Juvenile Project I mentioned earlier, we know that youth who are detained often do not receive the treatment and services they need, especially in the area of mental health. Specifically, researchers found that five years after their initial reviews and interviews, more than 45% of the males who have been detained and nearly 30% of the females who have been detained had one or more psychiatric dis disorders. We can and must do better. We have to ensure that children who go through our system, who are evaluated, receive the treatment that they need. If we don't do that, then we're really not doing what's necessary and we're not making the beneficial system. Kids are better off after they leave than they were before they came. We also know from research that in many cases, out-of-home placement does more harm than good. Treating youth like adults is not only ineffective, but it can have grave consequences for them and for our communities. Now, let me be clear. There are some cases where detention or confinement is necessary. However, while some youth may need to be confined, they still need to be cared for, and that is why today's discussion is so important. The presenters who, you are, who are with us today are proposing innovative ideas to address this problem. First, they recommend continuing to reduce the number of children in out-of-home placement. Second, they suggest fundamentally altering the way placement works. They advocate for small, modern programs that are operated according to a developmental and trauma-informed approach that promotes healing and reduces future offending. The authors argue that these programs could be closer to use homes to encourage family and community engagement and reintegration. The researchers also argue that these changes can fundamentally change the trajectory of a young person's life. There is a way to do things differently, to do things better. We need to address the trauma in the lives of children who come into contact with our justice system. And we need to focus our efforts on restoration, on recovery, on healing, and on rebuilding lives. To do this, we must start with good quality research that is the work that we will hear about today. It is now my pleasure to introduce Patrick McCarthy and Vincent Chiraldi, two of the three authors of the Future Youth Justice, a community-based alternative to the youth prison model that is being released today. Patrick is a respected clinician and public sector leader who serves as the president and CEO of the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Before joining the foundation, he held positions ranging from psychiatric social worker to university professor and division director at the Delaware Department of Services for Children, Youth, and Their Families. Vinny is a senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where he directs the program in criminal justice policy and management. Previously, Vinny was the director of juvenile corrections for the District of Columbia and a commissioner of probation for New York City. In Washington and New York, Vinny gained a national reputation as a reformer who emphasized the humane and decent treatment of men, women, and children under his supervision. Please join me in welcoming Patrick and Vinny. Good morning, everyone. I wonder if we could uh, 
have the, uh, it's okay now? Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I look across this room and I see a lot of familiar faces as well as people I don't know. But I do know that the folks in this room, many of you have dedicated your careers to helping young people turn their lives around. And I know that many of you have dedicated your careers to trying to advocate and build a more effective, a more humane, and a more common sense approach to juvenile justice. Just a few days ago, we lost one of our leaders and one of our good friends, Ned Lochran. Few people in this country invested more tireless energy, more optimism, more determined passion, more of himself than Ned. I'd like us to take just a moment uh, to remember Ned with a moment of silence, please. The news of Ned's death actually took me back to my earliest days working in the juvenile justice field. I had been asked to take responsibility for the Delaware state system of juvenile corrections, and I had made my first visit to what I now call a youth prison, although that's, that's not what we called it. We called it a youth rehabilitation center. What I saw that day, what I heard, the young people I met, what I smelled that day really shook me to my very core. I've never forgotten it. And I can still remember being haunted by the idea that one of my own children, I had four and any one of them was a candidate, but one of my own children might spend even a day in this type of facility. Ned was one of the first people I connected with, and he was a guiding light towards the idea that there was a better way and a different way. He'll be missed by all of us. The time has come. In fact, it's way past time to recognize the justice, the rightness, and the inevitability of a simple idea. We need to and we can close every last youth prison in America. Now, to be sure, as Bob said, some youth will need secure confinement. But far, far fewer than are locked up today and for much shorter periods. And secure confinement does not mean that we should be locking up our young people in facilities that, in all but their name, are virtually indistinguishable from adult prisons. The time has come to fundamentally reform juvenile justice from the deep end all the way to the front end. And it's time to replace our current failed system with a system that is community-based, that's focused on positive youth development, and that does what it is meant to do, which is to help kids who have come in contact with the law get back on track. It's time to build systems that will act as on-ramps to success rather than off-ramps. Now, no one, no one who has spent any length of time in one of our current large youth prisons could possibly walk away without a deep gut sense that these institutions are simply no place for kids. And now we also have, on top of that gut sense, we also have decades of hard evidence that not only do they not do good, they actually do real and lasting harm. And we have choices. Thanks to many of the people in this room and others, we have experience, we have evidence of alternatives that work so much better. We have lessons learned about how to overcome the challenges in making this kind of change and getting better results. 
And finally, I have rarely seen any idea that pulls together so many interests at once. This is the public policy trifecta. Closing youth prisons is good for community safety. It'll keep our communities safer. It's good for kids. It'll help them build a better future. And it's a much better public investment of taxpayer resources and a much better investment in our nation's future. And in fact, much of the public recognizes this. A polling done by the Pew Charitable Trust, polling done by the Casey Foundation, polling done by others, has shown that most Americans, including crime victims, believe that yes, youth should be held accountable, but they should be helped to get back on track. They do not support the use of these kinds of punitive approaches and these harsh conditions as a way to punish children. Now, the model of youth prison has been around for a long time, it goes back to the 1840s when reformers thought that these new institutions, sometimes called training schools even today, would reform kids. They were well-intentioned. They were wrong. They were dreadfully and grievously wrong then, and it is dreadfully and grievously and inexcusably wrong now that we know so much more about juvenile delinquency, so much more about families, so much more about adolescent development. We know from our experience and from the science that these institutions provide pretty much the exact opposite of what kids need for their social, educational, emotional, uh, and neurological development. Let me give, give you just a few obvious examples of the mismatch between what we currently do in these youth prisons and what we know about young people and about juvenile delinquency. We know young people are heavily influenced by their peers, especially young people who get in trouble with the law. In fact, one of the strongest predictors of delinquent behavior is having a social circle that is dominated by delinquent peers. That's what the science tells us. So what do we do? We take our young people who've gotten in trouble and we put them in youth prisons that by their very nature create incredibly intense relationships among those peers, all with a history of breaking the law, the exact opposite of what the science tells us. And rather than becoming schools for reform, they become schools for crime. Second, young people, especially when they get in trouble, no matter who they are, need positive interactions with caring, supportive adults to help them build their self-esteem and their self-confidence. What do youth prisons do? Youth prisons pit young people against adults as they struggle around issues of power and control. Third, we know by the very nature of neurological development and physiological development that young people actually need opportunities to make mistakes. But that's how they will learn about impulse control, about judgment, a future orientation. That's how they'll build emotional maturity. They do this by making mistakes and learning from them, but only if they believe that they can do better. Only if they see themselves as a good person with a future and with potential. So what do we do with youth prisons? We reinforce the absolute most negative images that young people have of themselves. And we tell them in a hundred ways, not about their potential, but rather that they are dangerous and that they are to be feared on the one hand, and at the same time, that they are worthless and that they have no future. Fourth, as Bob pointed out, most incarcerated youth have histories of trauma. Anyone who's been through trauma, and some of my own children have been through this, so I've experienced this, anyone who's been through trauma is especially sensitive to environmental triggers. What are we doing with our young people who've experienced trauma when they go into a youth prison? 
We use isolation and solitary confinement, a known trigger for trauma reaction. We use both chemical and physical restraints. We put them in an environment that is incredibly sterile, with bright lights, with constant noise. We put them in situations where every single day they are in a struggle with correctional officers who are trying to maintain control. We put them in situations where almost every day they experience the threat of violence. Anyone who's experienced trauma or chronic stress, such as abuse and poverty, loss of a loved one, witnessing violence, these are all well-known triggers resulting in anger, in acting out, in aggression and depression, all of which then become a self-fulfilling prophecy. See, look how they act when they are acting in response to the conditions that we put them in. We can't really be all that surprised when we see the awful results of this approach. These institutions are factories of failure. We have decades of proof. Advancements in brain science has given us even greater understanding, but we didn't need that knowledge. We didn't need to know what we now know from brain science to know that our approach doesn't work. It doesn't help get kids back on track, not when you have a 70 to 80% recidivism rate and research that tells us that incarceration actually increases recidivism. We spend an enormous amount of money to get those lousy community safety results. This approach is anything but friendly to public budgets. Costs range from 85,000 to 250,000 per child per year with the average of $146,000. Surely we can find better ways to invest that money. In fact, today we are investing that money in institutions that are abusive and corrosive to our own values and our own beliefs in human dignity. The abuse that we see in these institutions seems to, to be built into the very walls. The Casey Foundation has been tracking data over a long period of time and it confirms our own experience and our gut sense and our worst fears. Serious abuse, physical abuse, sexual assaults, unbridled use of solitary confinement have all been documented in over 30 states in just the last decade and more are reported every year. We simply can't stand by and let more kids be subjected to these conditions. We wouldn't want our own child to be subjected to these conditions. On top of all of that, if that wasn't enough, these institutions impact disproportionately our children of color. Youth prisons are one of many things that perpetuate our society's deeply ingrained ways of depriving people of color of opportunity. This chart essentially shows the difference in rates of confinement by different racial and ethnic groups. Now, the rate for white youth is way too high, 100 per 100,000. But when kids whose skin is black are nearly five times more likely to be incarcerated for similar offenses, something else is going on. And that something else is racism and racial bias, both conscious and unconscious. We could spend the day, many days, talking about all the evidence for this, but just one example from just one study of how our biases impact our work. A study of probation officers showed that when they were presented with examples of behavior and asked to make conclusions about the young person, if they thought the young person was white, they tended to see the challenge as coming from external issues beyond that young person's control. That's how they interpreted the behavior. The exact same behavior. If they believed that the young person was African-American, 
they tended to say it was due to attitude and personality traits. Now, these are not biases that are limited to probation officers. These are biases, conscious and unconscious, that we all carry. And because of that, we have to build everything into our system to make sure that there are protections against our own bias, especially when the results of that bias are things like incarceration in one of these institutions. So in summary, I call these places factories of failure. I think the evidence is clear. These institutions fail at protecting the community. They fail at turning lives around. They fail at being cost effective. They fail at protecting kids from abuse. And none of this is new news, especially to all of you in this room. Now, during my time in Delaware, I tried mightily to reform the institutions that were under my responsibility. And to tell the truth, there are a lot smarter and much more effective leaders who've done the same in states all over the country. Vinny's a great example of that. None of us have succeeded in a sustained way to turn these institutions around because the very institution itself trumps our best efforts. Jerry Miller said it about as well as anybody when he said reformers come and go, but still these institutions carry on and they carry on. I believe it's an inescapable fact that these large youth prisons cannot be reformed. And that what, that's what leads us to the conclusion that a coordinated, well-sequenced, and comprehensive approach is needed, and it must include closing youth prisons. I said earlier, we have a choice. We are at an opportunity moment. The numbers of young people who are locked up has come way down, and it continues to drop. So the scope of the problem becomes more manageable. We have public support for this change. We have political support on both sides of the aisle and across the ideological spectrum. And we know what to do. We cannot miss this opportunity moment. It may close. We don't act now. It's common sense. It's been a long time coming. It's a fiscal, moral, uh, moral social, and political imperative. We know what we should do, and I believe we know how to do it. And Vinny's going to take us through some of the steps that we need to take in order to accomplish that. Thanks, Patrick. I'll try to get through this quickly so we can get to the good part, which is the panel. Um, I do want to just depart from the uh, text just for a moment, because I don't know that we'll get a chance with this cast of folks at the Justice Department to all be in the same room again, uh, talking about juvenile justice reform. This has been an, a time of enormous change um, for the better. In, in the criminal justice field, in the juvenile justice field, we still have a long way to go. But uh, since we might not be around these folks again for too much longer, I'd like, I'd like folks to just stand and give a little round of applause to people like Carol Mason, Nancy Rodriguez, Bob Listenby, and their staff. The fantastic work. That takes care of the audience participation uh, part of my presentation, and I will now move on. Um, okay, so um, Patrick and I looked at uh, research, looked at the history of these institutions, of scandal and abuse, the mismatch between developmental psychology and what we do to young people in these facilities, racial disparities, big costs, lousy outcomes, and came up with four uh, uh, R's, four approaches to being able to eliminate this problem that we derived from looking at what innovative states and cities have done around the country. And those are reduce, reform, replace, and reinvest. And I'll say more about each one of those as I go through each individual arm. OK, so reduce is the first one. That we can safely reduce the pipeline into youth prisons by at least half. Um, and we can do so by limiting commitment of the most serious young people into these facilities, 
uh, developing a range of programs and services to meet the various new needs of young people and their strengths by creating smaller individualized setting closer to the young people's homes and ultimately by actually closing facilities, not just by feeling good that we've reduced the numbers, but by actually closing facilities. So to start on reduce, states like Texas and California have actually eliminated whole categories of young people who were formerly able to be committed to their state training schools. I'm gonna focus on Texas, that's the little red star down there on my, on my map. Um, they, they had terrible widespread sexual and physical abuse of young people in their facilities in the early 2000s. The legislature acted decisively in 2007. They prohibited kids committed, uh, who were convicted of misdemeanors from being placed in their youth prisons, limited the age of confinement to age 19, and then formula granted to counties a bunch of money so that they could do stuff with kids in those communities. They increased community funding by 38% and half of the budget of the Texas Juvenile Justice Agency goes to community programs, not to locked facilities. What were the results of this? The Texas Youth Commission population has declined by two thirds and they closed eight youth prisons, saving $150 million. It's really important to close the facilities. Lots of people don't get that part because it's the hard part. It's, 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 it's a lot easier to get a facility from 200 to one kid than it is to get it from one to zero kids. Um, Connecticut is a, a good example. They have 43 kids left in their 250 bed facility in Connecticut and the budget for the facility is $53 million. It's more than a million dollars per kid. When Governor Cuomo started in New York State, his first act as governor was to tour a facility that was fully staffed but completely empty of kids. There were no kids left. Gave rise to his most, his, his biggest uh, applause line during his first State of the Union address, in which he stated a state address in which he said, incarceration is not an employment program. We don't put other people in juvenile justice facilities to give some people jobs. This chart up here sort of takes us through how this played itself out in California. So if you look at this chart, it goes from 1996 to 2008. So from 1996 to 2008, California went from having about 10,000 kids in locked custody to about 1,700 kids, massive de-incarceration. But because it wasn't closing facilities, the cost for, per kid increased sevenfold. It went from 36,000 to $252,000 per kid. Then in 2008, California started closing institutions. They closed eight institutions and got themselves a more reasonable cost per kid. So what's the results of all of this? This massive downsizing. Again, back to Texas. So Texas, there was a 38%. We, we, we looked at the period from 2007 to 2013 because we had data across several areas. There's a 38% decline in the number of kids confined in youth facilities, a 49% uh, drop, a remarkable 49% drop in youth arrests statewide in Texas. On the adult side, there was a more modest 2% decline in adult imprisonment. Come on. And an 8% decline in adult arrests. So put a different way, Youth incarceration in Texas declined at 19 times the rate at which adult incarceration declined, driven by policies enacted by the legislature and signed into law by the governor, but youth arrests declined five times as much as adult arrests declined. So now it's reasonable to ask, is Texas and California the anomalies, or could this happen in other places? This next chart gives us an example of uh, at least part of the answer. There's almost twice as many youth are in youth prisons for nonviolent crimes as are in for violent crimes. Not the kinds of stuff that scares people, giving rise to what Patrick talked about earlier, Pew and youth um, first uh, polling that shows that about eight out of 10 people support moving kids from youth prisons into the community if the, if the resources follow. Reform. So we could, we could reform the culture that wrongly assumes that locking up kids makes us safer. I'm going to talk a little about New York City. Uh, it's that red star up there, which is where I was. 
Several of you died in care in state facilities in 2008. The governor impaneled a commission the Justice Department investigated. Both reports revealed atrocities. Uh, they died in uh, harsh takedowns like this one here. Um, and city stakeholders then, the governor and mayor, met and said, OK, we're going to stop having any kids from New York City go to these youth prisons. They transferred all of the kids within two years from state facilities to small home-like facilities within New York City. Juvenile arrests have dropped by half. The number of kids in placement at all dropped by 53% because in the process of this, the city expanded uh, youth, uh, its youth continuum for a range of programs for young people. And there's a range of programs for young people and the ones that do get incarcerated, get incarcerated in eight or 10 bed facilities in the five boroughs rather than throughout the state. I'm gonna go very quickly past replace because I'm running out of time because the replace story is the Missouri story and we have Phyllis Becker on the next panel who can tell that story better than anybody. Um, but 30 years ago, similarly, Missouri had their kids in harsh locked facilities, centralized large youth prisons, and they've now gone to a network of the most decent and humane facilities anywhere in the country uh, for young people. They tend to top out at 40 beds. Some of them are much smaller than that. You can see what, what they look like rather than this sort of harsh prison-like atmosphere, decent, normalized care for somebody uh, the way you would want for your own child if they had to be in locked custody. And then finally, oops, reinvest. So if you do the first three R's, if you reduce, reform, and replace, you can do the fourth R. You can reinvest the savings and have that money follow the kids from the facilities into community. And here we talk about Ohio in 1992. Ohio's facilities were at 180% of capacity. This is not uncommon. California's were at 180% of capacity at that time as well. The kids were stacked on top of each other in deplorable conditions. and the policymakers in Ohio found that there was a skewed incentive system, that it was actually free for county officials to send kids to state care, but if they kept them locally and tried to program them in local communities, the county had to pay for all of that. So as a result, cash-strapped counties were sending kids to state care. Instead, Ohio flipped the script on that and started to provide funds to counties that they wouldn't send kids to state care. There was a dramatic decline in the number of kids in state custody. So now we see this chart, which uh, charts it from 1997 to 2013. Once again, very similar to Texas. There was a 47% decline in the number of kids locked up. A 65, a remarkable 65% decline in youth arrests. Adult incarceration actually went up by 8%. And it, oops. And there was a more modest decline in, not insignificant, but 32% decline in adult arrest. So again, put another way, Ohio cut its youth incarcerated population in half while increasing adult incarceration and experienced twice the decline in youth arrests as it did in adult arrests. Well, back to our original big finding, now is not the time for half measures. We don't know when there will be a similar scientific, political, and policy alignment now we have to eliminate the youth prison from America's juvenile justice landscape, replacing it with a developmentally appropriate range of community programs, including small, home-like facility near kids' homes for the few who need to be held in secure care. And if you want to read the report, you can find it there. Thanks, everybody. again in thanking uh, Patrick and Vinny for their presentation. I am Brent Cohen, Senior Advisor here at the Office of Justice Programs, and it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for our expert panel. Dr. Nadine Brasia is the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Minority Health and the Director of the Office of Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Nadine is a pediatrician by training and one of our closest partners on the President's My Brother's Keeper initiative, a milestone six work where we specifically focus on reducing violence and providing second chances for youth. Please join me in welcoming Nadine and our panelists to the stage.
Good morning. Oh, let's try that one more time. I'm the daughter of former educators, so my, t my parents would always check in with their students throughout the day. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. The level of energy that I saw in the room when I came in here, I knew I could get a good morning out of all of you. So thank you for that warm uh, good morning. It is such a pleasure uh, to be here uh, with all of you this morning. Uh, and as our panelists uh, get settled, I want to do a, a, a few rounds of thanks and, and first certainly thanking Assistant Attorney General uh, Carol Mason for her leadership and true partnership. Uh, you know, being here is actually like being uh, at my second home, uh, the number of times I'm here at the Office of Justice Programs and the partnership that has been forged through this administration. So it's really a pleasure to participate uh, in such an important discussion. I want to thank Brent Cohen uh, for his uh, leadership in pulling this meeting together embarrassing a little bit to say that we were on a panel, I, I was moderating a panel, and Brent was the panelist uh, at the White House for a group of nurses, and uh, Brent was talking about, he started his discussion talking about the brain science and adolescent development and health issues of youth, and I turned and looked at him and I said to the nurses, I said, we all need to pause because it's the Department of Justice who was talking about adolescent development and brain science, and afterwards he had a fan club surrounding him uh, at the end of the panel, so he, he definitely has some champions uh, rooting for him in health. Uh, certainly Patrick and Vinny for their important work um, in, in this report, uh, as well as all of you who are here uh, that have committed to, to uh, this work and those that are watching online, uh, as well as the leadership of Administrator Liston B and Director Rodriguez uh, for their important work here uh, at the Department of Justice. You know, I have to say at the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, where our mission uh, is to enhance and protect the health and well-being of all Americans, we understand uh, that investing in and advancing the health of our nation's youth is really critical to our country's success. But to realize those uh, ladders of opportunity for our youth, especially for our most vulnerable youth, it means that we have to work with other sectors. And you certainly heard that from the speakers that preceded me, uh, that it's not something that health can do alone. Uh, it, it means including and working with justice. Because as we know, health is not just determined by what happens when you're in the doctor's office or you're in a, in a hospital, but that our health is truly influenced by the conditions in which we are born and where we grow, where we live and where we work and where we age. And I saw that connection very early on in, in my training, the connection between health and justice uh, as I was training to become a pediatrician. As part of our residency training program in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I worked in a juvenile detention facility uh, and I have to tell you, it was one of the most memorable experiences that I had in my training. Lessons from the youth that I cared for when they were willing to and, and felt comfortable enough to open up to me. And, and I was known as one who really focused not just on the past medical history and the medications, but the social history so that I could understand the circumstances of the youth that I was caring for. And I learned about the trauma that they had experienced in early childhood, whether it was being separated from their parents or witnessing violence themselves the series of disappointments uh, that they experienced, the lack of positive role models and loving, caring adults in their lives, uh, the pressure to join gangs or the lack of support in their schools, and for many of them, not even understanding why they were in the facility in the first place and what they had actually done wrong. And it changed my perspective of saying, what did they do to what happened to them? And realizing that we needed to do more. It made me connect that what we were learning in our training in adolescent development uh, to the impact of adverse childhood experiences and trauma on their mental and physical health and well-being. And you heard uh, at the Ministry of Liston we talk about that, that these are not just short-term health effects uh, on youth, but they're well-studied long-term effects into adulthood where we see disparities in mental health issues and substance use disorders, where we see high rates of chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes and asthma and even early death. And it made me connect what was the reality of opportunity or really the lack of opportunity that lied ahead, laid ahead for them. And, and so I knew that there was more that we could do uh, that we as physicians and health uh, needed to be at the table and working with our partners in justice and education and housing and labor and other sectors to push for equity and opportunity uh, for all of our youth, including justice-involved youth. And in pediatrics, certainly, where we're also proponents for prevention and wellness, how we actually prevent youth from entering the justice system in the first place. So I still carry those lessons, those experiences, and those youth uh, with me today. 
uh, where I have the privilege of leading the Office of Minority Health. And I'm using this opportunity to really advance the programs and policies that will address trauma among minority youth and raise awareness between the connection of justice and health and forge stronger partnerships, for example, as we're doing through a new grant program with the Department of Justice's COPS Office on bringing law enforcement and public health together to, to address youth violence and prevent youth violence through a public health framework. And as Brent noted, through the President's My Brother's Keeper initiative, it has truly opened uh, new doors of opportunity, breaking down silos between sectors uh, and really forging partnerships, for example, between Health and Human Services and Justice to create ladders of opportunity for our youth. So let's begin. Let's begin, and, I, and I'm really pleased to moderate this incredible group of, of experts and advocates to talk about community-based approaches to juvenile justice. I'll start with uh, Daquan Beaver, who is here from Rise for Youth, which is a campaign in support of community alternatives to youth incarceration. Uh, he was incarcerated in the juvenile justice system at the age of 14, and he's using his experience to help inform policy. Uh, Phyllis Becker. Seated next to him is the director of the Department of Social Services at the Missouri Division of Youth Services, where the vision of the Di Missouri Division of Youth Services is that every young person served by the division will become a productive citizen and lead a fulfilling life. Next to her is Professor K Kristen Henning, who is currently the director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and professor of law at the Georgetown Law Center. She previously served as lead attorney for the juvenile unit of the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. Next to her is Carl Racine, who is the Attorney General for the District of Columbia. Attorney General Racine is a lifelong resident of the District of Columbia, although I'll say we share Haitian roots, so he is my Haitian brother. Pray for him. <laughs> yes, indeed, pray for him. And one of his pledges um, as the DC Attorney General is to find alternatives that can divert young people out of the justice, juvenile justice system. Liz Ryan uh, is the President and CEO of Youth First Initiative. I'm a little out of order, my apologies. Uh, a national advocacy campaign to end the incarceration of youth by closing youth prisons and investing in uh, community based alternatives to incarceration and programs for. Tracy Wells Huggins is the Associate Director uh, for Justice of Fam for Families, a national alliance of local organizations that are committed to reducing youth incarceration. And the organization was founded and is run by parents and families uh, who have experienced the juvenile justice system with their children. And Tracy comes with this experience of being the parent of a child who uh, was incarcerated in the juvenile justice system. Dr. Jennifer Woolard is an Associate Professor of Psychology and Co-Director of the Great Graduate Program in Developmental Science at Georgetown University. Uh, she brings expertise in adolescent development within the context of juvenile justice with her research on the impact of juvenile justice in areas such as how it delays a young person's development and how trauma can be compounded in juvenile justice facilities. It's a phenomenal group that we have gathered here this morning. I'm going to start with um, a series of questions for our panelists, and then we'll open it up uh, for some uh, questions from uh, the audience, and really in reaction to certainly the, the paper that Patrick and, and Vinny presented, uh, your reactions, to share your reactions, and, and some specific and targeted uh, questions given your areas of expertise, your background and experience. And I'll, I'll start with Dr. Woolard. Uh, as a developmental psychologist, much of your work is centered on the intersections of adolescent development and justice involvement. Uh, so could you provide some additional context? We've been hearing about that certainly this morning, but could you provide some additional context about how juvenile justice involvement and specifically placement uh, in youth prisons, as uh, the term has been defined in the paper, impacts a child's ability to mature out of what will be termed Sure, I'd like to say that I feel almost redundant at this point, which is a good thing because the adolescent development research that wouldn't have happened without the support and encouragement and partnership of so many of you, um, I think has, has, um, has reached a number of audiences and, and it's really uh, terrific and delightful to see how folks who are working in the field are taking that work and implementing it in ways that those of us that sit in the university would never be able to do. We are not on the ground like you all are in policy and in practice. Um, but in terms of thinking about um, correctional facilities, as you asked, and kind of what the implications would be for uh, maturing into 
uh, healthy young adults. I think um, from a developmental psychology perspective, it really boils down to kind of two questions that we could ask as we think about these kinds of institutions or the kinds of responses that communities could make to youth who need these kinds of services. The first is what are the conditions that we know promote healthy adolescent development, right? Uh, and the second question is then what are the characteristics of environments that maximize the likelihood that those conditions of healthy development will occur and that youth can take advantage of them. Um, we certainly know that settings shape human behavior and vice versa, that our behavior shapes and then pulls those settings as well. Um, and so while acknowledging that the youth we're talking about face particular challenges and have engaged in behaviors that require uh, a, um, an appropriate response, um, we know that adolescent development is a time of tremendous growth and opportunity. When we think about adolescents uh, experiencing that growth and opportunity in an institution, particularly a large institution, I think it doesn't take a whole lot of science to begin to see how those opportunities are constrained in ways that may not be helpful and may actually be harmful in some circumstances. So the jobs of adolescents, right, they are increasing self-regulation and executive function. They're learning how to regulate themselves and developing the brain capacity to do so. It's a normative part of growing. Um, they engage in healthy sensation seeking and risk taking. That's a part of the job of adolescents. Sometimes it is manifested in ways that are not healthy or helpful, but they need to begin to engage uh, in these kinds of behaviors to learn more about themselves and the environments that they're growing in. Increasing autonomy while maintaining healthy relationships. Probably if I could boil down the, the most important aspect of adolescence relationships might be the word that I would use, right? And the need to engage in healthy relationships while having structured guidance to create the room to grow. But we also know, as several people have mentioned, adolescent can be a time of risk, harm, trauma, and victimization as well. And we need to think about the environments that we create that are gonna be responsive and try to help them navigate those experiences into healthy young adulthood. So quickly, what are some of the characteristics of environments that we could think about that these youth would need and then how we might create those experiences and those environments for them? In some ways, we can just look initially to what are the characteristics and attributes of healthy families. This is the context in which most adolescents grow up and in which we wish all adolescents would grow in the context of healthy families. There are obviously special considerations, as I said here, for some of the experiences of youth we're talking about. But we're looking for contexts that promote resilience, healthy amounts and types of stress, a strengths-based approach, that, but doing so, a strengths-based approach, requires the capacity in that institution and the will to identify and nurture those individual strengths and to be sensitive to the challenges that individual youth, youths face. The context needs to be able to have the resources to do that, to understand the needs of the youth and his or her family. And I think the importance of the adults around that youth, be it staff in a particular program, to be able to model the normative values and the relationships and the, um, the solutions to conflict that we want to instill in youth through the staff engagement with youth and with each other. Um, the research indicates that youth's affective experience of their environment as they're growing is incredibly important. And the justice research that some of you cited before shows that that's related to post-adjudication and incarceration outcomes that experience can be directly linked. Um, so I guess uh, to sum up, I would say, you know, the importance of thinking about a youth-centered approach as opposed to a program-centered approach or an institution-centered approach is really the way that we can think about this and in creating an environment in which the relational experience of youth with the adults around them helps promote that path to healthy adulthood. Thank you, Dr. Woolard. Tracy, let's turn to you. Um, you, know, you work with families all across the country who have a family member uh, in the juvenile justice system. Based on your personal, your professional experience, how are families impacted? To make this personal, how are families impacted by the juvenile justice system when a young person is arrested? Families are impacted 
and traumatized by just the fact that their child has been acquainted in any way, shape, or form with the system. We understand that the system functions completely the way it's supposed to function, but that that needs to change. And the only way that that is going to change is by having the voices of the people most directly impacted by the system having a stake in what change really looks like. We agree that all juvenile prisons really should be shut down. We understand and definitely believe that now is the prime opportunity for that to happen. Further, we understand and believe that that cannot happen effectively, real transformation, without those voices. And how that can happen is by making sure that we, at Justice for Families, believe we instill the four core values of what real family engagement looks like. It's not a box on a sheet that you can check off because you invited families to a conversation or a meeting. What it is, is a combination of four core values. The first would be that family engagement is a mindset that must be adopted. It begins by changing the narrative that we have about the families that we serve. There is almost a historical uh, belief that any child who becomes acquainted with this system comes from a family that has absolutely no skill set and no capacity to provide anything of health, welfare, or well-being for that child. So we need to begin to change that mindset. That narrative must change. We also have to believe that it's not going to happen just because of a single policy, program, or practice change. It has to be something that is a full indoctrination of really debunking what we currently have because we know it doesn't really work. Family engagement must be something that is understood to be alive, ever evolving, and ongoing. It is not something that you're going to have a one and done experience with. It's going to have to be something that is really fully embraced with an intention to making sure that our youth have the best outcomes with the understanding that families and youth are the experts on their own experiences, on their own lives, and on the plans for their success. We can't define that. Secondly, there needs to be an obligation to defining family broadly. My son's acquaintance with the system led me to a much broader uh, familiarity with the system because I am the mother to so many children in my community and in states all across the country. What I learned was that many times we're limited because of the constraints that exist because we have just the biological definition of family. But we also know and understand that by defining family broadly, you actually build a base of support for young people that allows them to be able to know who has their back, wants to see them successful, and provides them with an opportunity to expand their support network. That doesn't always happen by having your biologically tethered people with you by themselves. Thirdly, the culture and context of family engagement must be something that is deeply understanding of cultural and community and trauma. And I keep hearing it over and over again, and it's really refreshing. Like she said, it's redundant, but it's something that must be heard because we tend to forget that or else relegate it to another. And then finally, we have to, as individuals and as systems, understand that self-examination and patience are key. But that, that intention for a real transformation of this entire system to take place can and must happen, but it can only happen with the voices, once again, of the families and the youth who are directly impacted by the system, not only as engagement, as a saying, but as partners in the work. And if we don't begin to see engagement as partnership, we're going to continue to have what we've always had, which is a stunting of the real change that we all desire. Very powerful message, and thank you for those, those four steps. Daquan, why don't we turn to you, because you've spoken <laughs> And we're hearing this from the voice of a parent and answering from someone who's also an advocate and turn that experience into advocacy, but you have experienced this yourself. You've publicly spoken about your own experience in Virginia's juvenile justice system, uh, what you've described as the failure of juvenile prisons. Could you share a bit about what you've seen go wrong with the current model and whether you think, uh, for example, the small home life facilities that have been suggested in this report would be an Oh, first of all, that. I have it up. Alright. Um, so I'm gonna start by saying I went with um to any KC people to a actual penitentiary, like a state penitentiary, and being inside the penitentiary, which just so happens to be right across from the facility I was in, um, they look exactly the same. Like outside 
inside, like they look exactly the same. And um, it just brought to realization again that the facilities that we use to hold our youth, which I hate that word, um, are just leading our youth to go across the street, essentially. And I think that while I was locked up, I didn't realize until an incident happened um, that caused the facility to be locked down. And um, we were locked down for Christmas. And it was like two or three days. And when we were, we were supposed to see our family on Christmas, but we couldn't because of the lockdown. And um, when we were able to see our parents, I came to visitation. And this is a facility of like 300 plus kids. And I'm happy to see my mom, but I look around the facility and I only see like five kids getting visits. So I asked my mom, like, did anybody leave? And she was like, no. So I was like, hmm. And then it's like something just hit me after that day. And I started saying things that I didn't see before. Like the way staff talked to us and they told us, like, we don't have rights. Like once you come in here, you don't have rights. So we were like less of people. Um, I've seen staff actually beat up kids and they get away with it because we don't have rights. Like we're not people. And um, I've seen um, kids who have uh, mental illnesses and they're actually put in units by themselves. Like they go to lunch by themselves. They go to school separate from everyone else. And I, no one sees anything wrong with that. Every, everyone thinks, well, they're special so they need to be separated from the rest of the facility but you're actually locking them up inside. It's like, it's like almost like solitary confinement. They don't get to move. Um, so these facilities, especially um, the ones that I've been inside, like they're very outdated, they're old. Um, they obviously don't work. They cost too much. I know last year it cost about $100. $40,000, $150,000 to incarcerate one kid for one year. And we have kids being locked up for like violations for not going to school because their brother was sick. Like it's, it's, it's really silly stuff. And um, I know that working with the youth network that I work with in RISE, we're talking to um, youth about like what they think that would help them. And we, we focus a lot on um, the continuum and a question that I ask them to kind of make them more familiar with the continuum and um, to help them. And I want other people to understand that the continuum does not specifically have to be a locked facility or a facility in general, right? Um, but this is something I want to give to you all to take away and to, to further understand how we can build this continuum is to ask yourself or to ask a youth, what is your therapy, right? Like take away juvenile justice, take away anything. Like if you come home and you had a bad day, like what is your therapy? What helps you get through that? And um, hold on, I just lost everything I was just saying just now. Um, so what is your therapy? And um, what would you like to do? Like something you would like to learn, something that you would, you, you think about like, I just wanna, I always wanted to do this. Some people say like sing, like I wish I could sing too, but like it's, you'll be surprised the answers you get from youth. Like it's a stereotype, right? That all black, like all most black young boys wanna be like basketball players, football players or rappers. But I've got like totally different answers from the group of kids that I work with. And um, I just think for me personally that there isn't enough support. Youth want people to believe in them, whether they say it or not. We want people to believe in us. And when we're in these facilities where you have some youth that don't get visits at all, you have some youth that just act out because all oh, they wanted some attention. Like you're that one kid on the unit who nobody ever pays attention to. So you you, you hit somebody or you don't go in your room. So everybody can be like, oh, so that's that guy, right? You might not get the attention you want, but you're getting some kind of attention. And I feel like if we start that before in the prevention process, then it will 
eventually increase and go into um, inside the facility. We do not, I repeat, we do not need these huge facilities because all it does is break us down. Um, it breaks us down mentally, it breaks us down physically, um, and I think it's kind of like an oxymoron to say, well, we want our youth to be successful citizens of the community, um, but you leave the door open to have them in a box or a cage like an animal for <laughs> even a day, because that one day will change the life of the hardest gangster that you think you know, because it's totally different on the inside. It's a whole different world. Um, but, yeah. yeah. I was gonna keep going. Just a, an excellent framework of context and, and how you describe them to, you know, we've been talking about the trauma that you may experience before getting into the system, but then the, the trauma that actually happens as they're in the system, right, and, and the impact that that has. And I, I really love your question about, you know, asking them what their therapy is and what they want to be. Uh, I had a habit of asking my patients, what did you want to be when you grow up? And I, when I'd have si a bunch of siblings, the older sibling would, like, tell them, you better tell Dr. Brass what you want to be. You better think about something you want to be if you don't know, because I wouldn't accept it. I don't know. Because they want to be something. So. Attorney General, I turn to you as the Attorney General for the District of Columbia. Your office uh, is responsible, uh, you know, as, as your statute for prosecuting ju juveniles who commit crimes. What are, what are your thoughts coming from your lens? Because you've also made a pledge to find alternatives to divert youth uh, out of the juvenile justice system. What are your thoughts about uh, this paper and how we can reduce the number of kids who are put into out-of-home placement facilities and move away uh, from this model? Sure. Thank you so very much, uh, Doctor. It's a pleasure and honor uh, to be here uh, representing the Office of Attorney General for the District of Columbia. I think as uh, Patrick McCarthy and Vinny noted, um, you know, the, real, the stars are truly aligned um, at this unique moment in time where, you know, it just appears as though you've got the right people, candidly, in the right places with the right science and the data overwhelming the public who is now open to the concept of reform and justice. Um, so um, uh, in regards to your question about Patrick's and Vinny's uh, paper, I think it's, uh, you know, honestly, I think it's incredibly persuasive. I think it should direct our policy going forward in regards to the kinds of systems uh, we create and the kinds that must instantly, you know, be taken down. Um, I also need to note that since we're in the District of Columbia, there seem to be so many alums in this family who worked in the District of Columbia. And I want to really recognize um, the current DYRS head, Clinton Lacey. I want to say two things about Mr. Lacey. Number one, don't become an alum anytime soon. <laughs> Uh, we really need you here, uh, and what Lacey is about, fundamentally, Tracy, is what you talked about, which is at DYRS, he is really going about creating a culture of staff who understand that their role is to not be guards, but to be family, and to help provide that consistent guidance and, frankly, backstop of love you know, that the kids who fall into uh, the system and go to an area where they're either in a secured location or the equivalent of a, a shelter house, they need to be surrounded by that. So good things are happening in the District of Columbia, and I'm fully supportive of, uh, of your uh, initiative. As an elected official, that could come back and haunt me, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't need the job that much, to be honest. And so uh, I'm now a prosecutor for kids in D.C., but to be clear, my experience with young people in D.C. is largely shaped by two uh, experiences. Number one, growing up here in the district uh, and playing in youth sports and seeing, you know, all kinds of kids from throughout the city uh, and attending public school. And it became clear to me that I was a little different 
even though many of the kids who were my friends and who I played with and traveled with were every bit as talented as I was, I realized I was a little bit different because my mom and my dad and my sister and other peer groups, I guess we saw some data that we are, in a way, who we hang with, um, were enough to build in some resilience for me to sort of not make real bad decisions. Instead, I made bad decisions that people helped me get through. Um, so that's, you know, fundamentally an important part of where I come from as a prosecutor. And then secondly and importantly, you know, I was, like Chris, a public defender here in D.C. Unlike the storied history of so many public defenders in D.C., I wasn't that good at trial. So when I had juvenile cases, I had to turn that into a real strength at disposition. Uh, and so I really got into the idea of creating programs, plans for kids that had nothing to do with the criminal justice system. And so we fundamentally believe at the Office of Attorney General that young people need to be supported, need to be evaluated, as, you know, as Bob talks about, lead with science. And so what we do is we really focus on trying to, as the gatekeeper of the system, keep as many kids out as possible. So how do we do it? We've partnered with the Department of Human Services and the Department of Behavioral Health in the District of Columbia uh, to create a very robust diversion program that's science-based, focused um, first on the giving all the kids a CAFIS evaluation and assessment before diversion, midterm diversion, and then final. And if you know CAFIS, really what it measures is it measures essentially stress, anxiety, and trauma level and really gives you a gauge as to the kind of pressure uh, a kid is going through. Whether it's a kid who is arrested for not paying a fare at a metro, um, or a kid who's in a you know awful fight at school, the stress level can vary. Uh, at the CAFIS, uh, the CAFIS stress levels of about 80, 90, kind of high but norm. We often have kids that are way over 150 points. Then what do we do? We focus in again with the family and adults and teachers in their lives, try to tailor individual services to the kids. As somebody said here, kids need different services. There's not a cookie cutter approach. Through these uh, diversion services, I'm happy to report uh, that well over 750 cases now, diversion, I'm happy to report that 90% of our kids have not been rearrested, and over 75% demonstrate significantly greater attendance at schools. And fiscally, as you guys made the point, do you know how much diversion costs? If we fully load the cost of a building and all that other stuff, $4,000 for six months of intensive services. And yet, even though all the stars are lined up, we nonetheless find ourselves begging uh, the, the, the powers that be who have control over the budget for just a little bit more money for something that works. And so I know we're preaching to the choir a lot here, but we have to serve as um, our own support group. And we've got to really get the word out beyond ourselves so that when we go and ask for money, right, that is going to send kids out of the jurisdiction uh, for three years at a cost of eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000, let us ask for more money for diversion because it works and keeps people safer. Um, so I'm happy to be here for the District of Columbia. Thank you, Attorney General Hassan, and for your leadership. Please. Thank you. I need to be grateful uh, to DOJ, you know, uh, for just their overall leadership and study. We always rely on the reports and the data that come out. And recently, we teamed together with the Office of the United States Attorney here in D.C., won a DOJ grant whereby we're going to seek you know, more innovative diversion, recidivism, uh, reducing programs in partnership uh, with the United States Attorney's Office for young people uh, between the ages of 18 and 24. That would not have been possible but for uh, DOJ. Thank you.
So we have an example of, of you know, as a prosecutor, as you noted, but taking that leadership role and say, how do you actually design prevention right, and diversion and uh, in a culture change within your practice? So it um, really shows the importance of leadership uh, in this work. Uh, Phyllis, uh, we're going to turn to you now. With, um, your, your department has certainly been noted um, because Missouri uh, has implemented some of what the, the paper is actually arguing for. You've had a long career with the Missouri Division uh, of Youth Services and you've provided consultation uh, to other jurisdictions. So I was hoping you could talk a little more in depth uh, so we understand um, how the state of Missouri has really been utilizing these small facilities rather than more traditional models uh, and what challenges uh, do other states, what might other states have? Thank you, and I'm very pleased to be here today. And I also would like to say it's very wonderful to see that there is a growing consensus around what works for youth in our system, um, and uh, that they deserve a fighting chance to have fulfilling lives, as well as being treated humanely and with respect in, our, in any services that we provide. Um, three things came to mind to me um, in listening to our speakers today and reading the paper. And the first one that came to mind is, you know, what makes a youth prison at its core? Um, because many times we focus on the symptoms of the system and really don't get beneath what's under there, the underlying beliefs that make these unhealthy, uncaring, unsafe systems possible. So. That was one thing that came to mind to me. The other thing that came to mind to me was that how we make these changes is as important as the changes, the what. The how is as important as the what. Um, just like we can't tell a kid to change and expect that to happen. Many of you all have teenagers out there, right? When you tell them to change, they're gonna do it, right? So it's a process. And it's the same with these systems. Uh, it's not going to happen just because we say, this has gotta happen. And the last piece for me was sustainability. How do we sustain systems? There's a lot of discussion about people trying to do reform efforts and they're not sticking. So what do we need to think about to sustain um, effective programs and practices? So back to the what makes a uh, youth prison at its core, I really do think it's key to address those underlying belief systems that keep us from creating better systems. Um, you know, any system, it's any system that is punitive and abusive and has that as an underlying belief system is going to be a prison for youth. Doesn't matter if it's a social worker visiting them at their home, at a group home, a day treatment, or a high secure program. So I think we really do have to look at some of those underlying issues. Uh, closing down large institution is a necessary step, so I don't want to say that's not important, it's extremely important, um, but we have to look at those processes as well as the structural pieces of what we do. Um, we really have to equip staff to deal with these very challenging and complex issues in a different way. Um, if you ask, if you go to any system and the country now, I imagine if you ask any of those staff working there why they came into that system, they would tell you because they want to help kids. And so the system has, uh, but, but even folks with good intention, they go into a very unhealthy system, will adapt to that system or can adapt to that system or they leave the system. And so we really have to again kind of build on what everybody Everybody cares about kids. Uh, that's my belief, anyway. And um, but they're not. We're not given the opportunity, or the structure, or the will to do what we know is right. And so I think we have to think about that when we're talking about actual residential care. So I know for us in Missouri, when we began our change, we really began with dealing with people's beliefs and uh, about kids, and what we thought was important in terms of working with these youth. So we had to kind of shift from that whole correctional thinking, and I was a frontline staff, and, uh, and I was not doing very well in the system um, as it was when we were in our correctional mode. I didn't like being there, but I, it was a job. I liked the kids. So when we started making that shift, myself and many other staff in the system were very happy. We're like, okay, good. Now we're gonna really get to do what 
I thought I wanted to do when I came out of school is to help youth do what they need to do. So we really had to build on that um, and um, equip staff then and then bring in the training and um, professional development um, to help staff equip them with a new way of doing their work. And those who really, that was not their mindset, those staff naturally, many of them self-selected out of the system. And, um, and, and so, you know, you'll see that process happen. So I think, again, at dealing with the underlying issues, um, providing staff with a map um, is really important. Getting to the how it's done, you know, we talked a lot about what works. We know least restrictive environment works. We know developmental approaches work. We know trauma-informed approaches work. Family, youth input and engagement. Um, you have to have partnerships with, you know, the courts, the community, the state, the nonprofits, um, smaller programs close to home. Um, and, you know, we talked about being strengths-based and, um, and um, small groups and work with kids around all the empowerment piece, positive youth development, all those are things we know, that's the what. So how we go about doing it is, is kind of easier said than done in some ways. We've had the opportunity or the blessing of working on this for the past 30 years. And, and every day as the director of the Missouri Division of Youth Services, I still deal with, with the, 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 the system natural drift and pull towards doing things differently. So it's an everyday process to keep these systems healthy and supported for kids and staff in the system. So for us, it began with, you know, creating that culture of caring. Um, I was at a director's meeting and Clint brought up the whole concept of dare we say we wanted love the youth in our system. And so um, it's really making the shift in our mindset. These are young people who have come to us with lots of complex needs and issues that deserve to have, get help with those things. And to bring to the table their strengths, their unique talents um, to the table so they can help each other. Um, so you have to have that buy-in, the political buy-in um, and other stakeholders. I know systems who are now trying to go through reform process, it's very, could be very difficult. Um, you know, there's not, there's lots of forces out there that want to not let these things happen. And many of them are unconscious for many different reasons, historical and all those things. You have to get that political will. Um, you have to work with staff in the system. And, um, and for us, one of the things that helped us is having ongoing external champions. So we have a statewide advisory board, bipartisan board, that's really helpful to us in educating about what works for kids with the legislature. Um, to help us kind of meet our goals and needs. We also, for each of our programs, have a community liaison group that works with the individual programs to bring that community piece in. They work with the kids. Many of them are nonprofits now, and they create resources. So when our kids, if they're going to college, for example, they'll get them a laptop, those kind of things. So bringing that, you know, bringing in the community and um, unisolating your system and keeping it open helps bring that healthy culture into play. And, you know, we had to develop a set of beliefs about what we believe about youth and families and kids, that youth can change, that um, behavior has a purpose, um, that uh, families are vital to the treatment program. All of those things you have to be very explicit about because they become the foundation of that healthy culture. And in everything you do, you have to stick to that even when the going gets tough, even when youth are having the worst day ever, um, or a family member is struggling about understanding what's going on, you have to maintain that belief in that youth, that belief in that family, that we're all here to try to help um, a youth have greater and better well-being. So you have to stick to that, you have to stick through it in policy, you have to stick it in procedure, you have to stick to it how you put the kind of things you buy and bring into the program, uh, how you build your programs, um, all that has, the, that underlying belief system has to be reflected in all those places. And you have to get the right folks into the programs, the right people on the bus, as they say. So you have to have staff who care about kids. You have to have staff that are passionate about kids. 
um, and, um, want, and want to see kids change and are willing to be there for kids through the thick and thin. Um, Bill Milligan, who was at, with the community school systems, uh, talks about people um, change, relationships change people, not buildings, or not services or providers, but just the relationships, and that's very important. Um, you have to have appropriate resources, appropriate staffing. Um, you have to have physical structure that support trauma-informed care. Uh, you have to have training and professional development and, um, and engage leadership and staff. So um, those are all the things that kind of we worked with too. So thank you. Thank you. have some comments from our um, final two panelists and then open it up for, for Q&A. So I'm, no pressure to our final two. We're going to try to do um, a briefer answer so that we can uh, get to um, some audience Q&A as well. So Professor Henning, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, as a leader in the field of uh, juvenile ju defense, I want to ask you about the paper's first recommendation, which is uh, to significantly reduce the number of young people who are placed or sentenced, use the adult term, in a secure facility. You know, already reduced, as you, as you know, the, um, that population of kids in these facilities by half in the early 2000s. Um, is there room for further reduction? How do you push to get further reduction in those numbers, right, of kids who are actually uh, made sense? So let me say this, um, in my role as a defender, in terms of uh, how do we get folks to agree to reduce those numbers? And I hope what I will say today will um, increase the buy-in in terms of the success of a community uh, corrections approach, um, smaller facilities closer to home and a continuum of community-based care. So my job as a defender, and Carl alluded to this, is to provide holistic, a comprehensive advocacy for my kids. Um, and that is more than just helping them navigate the legal case, whether that be by trial or by plea, but to empower my clients, my young people that I work with, to disengage uh, or resist delinquent behavior um, and to become productive, successful citizens who can be uh, uh, proud of themselves and proud of their accomplishments. So how do we do that? I am much more successful as a, a, a defender um, empowering my child when I practice in a jurisdiction where I have a continuum of community-based alternatives and uh, smaller residential facilities that are closer to home. Um, when my options are limited to these large congregate care facilities, to be quite frank with you, I spend far too much of my time uh, representing kids in disciplinary hearings within the facility and trying to keep them out of solitary confinement because they're acting out to defend themselves, to protect their turf, to establish their place within the facility, um, to fit in with other kids um, and their peers who are also acting out. They're bored, they're frustrated, they're angry with the way staff are treating them, uh, they, they miss their families and they don't know how to communicate that other than acting out and they're acting out of trauma. Um, so far from teaching kids uh, how to develop these positive pro-social relationships, uh, we are merely exacerbating the impulsive behavior, reinforcing the really bad choices that we all made as kids. Is. Um, and we're increasing our, 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 our young people's exposure to, to, to negative peer influences. And also, when I uh, represent a young man like Eric in a congregate care facility, I have very little opportunity to help him with vocational programming, um, educational opportunities, and mental health services. So let's talk about what it looks like on the other side, when we have a, com a continuum of community-based resources. So if Eric is placed in a community or placed in a facility that's small and close to home, um, and I have a continuum of resources to offer him, um, then my advocacy starts with a team meeting where Eric comes to the table with all the key players, family members who come to the table to work with him. And we start identifying as the Quan talked about what are the kids, what are the young man's strengths? Does he like to work with people? Is he good with his hands? Um, does he like technology? Does he want to start his own business? That's the way uh, a team meeting, the planning will start. And we have an opportunity to think creatively about finding uh, and even creating new vocational opportunities and employment opportunities within the community that are uniquely tailored to this child's uh, specific uh, career interest and his, uh, and his talents. So for example, very recently I was working with a young person who said they uh, wanted to work with animals. 
And so we found and created him an internship at an animal shelter. Obviously, he couldn't have done that um, if he were in a, in a large uh, locked facility. Even more recently, I was out doing community service with a young man, and we were doing yard work, you know, trimming trees, planting. And at the end of the community service, he says to me, how can I start a business? Can you help me do flyers? This is the kind of successful uh, uh, rehabilitation that works. And I should note that this young man uh, was charged with a robbery. And I highlight that to say that even folks charged with, even young folks charged with serious offenses are appropriate and safe for the community um, when they have an, a, an appropriate continuum of services and wraparounds and supports. So um, on the educational front, we can have team meetings um, together with the young person. We can bring in school counselors, special education teachers, to, uh, 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 special education teachers. Um, we can bring in tutors from the community who, who have time for one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, opportunities or interactions with the young person. Um, and it's really hard to make that happen and uh, to get folks from the community, a special education teacher, actually to go in to the facility if they're not already employed there. It's really hard to do that. I think Jen and um, Tracy and Daquan have all talked about family. We know that it's essential for, for children to be engaged with uh, their families. And my, my clients complain, even, you know, uh, you know, New Beginnings has done a lot of, of wonderful new things, but even New Beginnings is too far. You know, for our kids who are in the District of, uh, of Columbia, um, for the parents to get out there on a weekly basis. So, um, and also, you know, so parents' visitation is supervised. Um, visitation takes place often in cafeterias and in gymnasiums with all the other kids watching. It's rarely accompanied by family counseling. So there isn't an opportunity for the child in the privacy that the child and the family need to, to, to begin the process of reunification. And then the final thing I'll say, which bridges from, well, the final thing I'll say about what we get from smaller uh, community facilities is when I talk about privacy, I think most about mental health services, right? Um, so in a smaller facility or a community-based uh, uh, program, I am able to help my kid agree to and buy into mental health services. Um, he's not likely to want to do that in a large congregate care facility with all of his friends watching. Um, so uh, we, we really want to think about the effective uh, continuum of mental health resources um, and the privacy that is important. So let me end uh, everything that I want to say by, by, by saying that the key to successful rehabilitation and successful defender advocacy, to be quite frank with you, is individualized planning. And Carl talked about this. It's individual planning that is uniquely tailored to the expressed interest of the child um, and to the strengths of the child. And research shows, um, if we had more time, I'd call on Dr. Willard, but research shows, and my own anecdotal evidence confirms, we've heard it from Tracy, we've heard it from Daquan, um, but that children are more likely to comply and succeed in a rehabilitative program when they are given a voice and an opportunity to help develop and design that program. Um, and so that's what community corrections um, allows us to do. They uh, give us an opportunity to be creative, to be individualized, and to engage youth in their own treatment. Thank you very much. So our final panel is Liz Ryan. Um, and as uh, Liz is responding, I'm looking at Brent to say, can, can folks maybe have time for one or two questions? Time for one question. Whoever runs to the mic first, I'm going to see who's the, who's the fittest, right? And do their physical activity. <laughs> <laughs> um, Liz, uh, so in the paper, it uh, describes the youth prison model as impervious uh, to reform, and, and you're working with states uh, around the country to advance uh, juvenile justice reform. How is uh, this paper relevant to the uh, work that people are doing, the advocacy work, to try to uh, uh, really promote reform in the states? Great, thank you. Um, it's been a really rich conversation uh, today, and I know we started out the conversation, Patrick, with you saying that this is an opportunity moment. So really, uh, it's timely that Justice Department is holding this conversation, and I really want to applaud the authors of the report uh, for making this available to us. It's really up to us to do something at this opportunity moment. All of us in this room and all of those who are watching us, I know from states as far away as Maine, Florida, California, Minnesota, Virginia, Connecticut, New Jersey, Iowa, and so on. Um, what we have here now is we have, with this report, we have an airtight case against youth prisons. 
and it's packaged by National Institute of Justice and Harvard. What could be better than that for advocates, right? What's the airtight case? Simply put, youth prisons aren't safe, youth prisons aren't fair, youth prisons don't work, and are inherently flawed and can't be fixed. We can do better. The public supports that change. We know what works to help young people grow and thrive. So let's stop incarcerating our kids. Let's stop building youth prisons. And let's invest in youth, in their communities, and their families. And I hope you'll join us, our campaign, uh, No Kids in Prison. We hope you'll join us and that you will think about starting a campaign in your own community to end this practice. And you've heard from a very diverse panel here, from prosecutors to defense, people running systems, people suing systems. We're all on the same page. So thank you. Do we have um, one question from the audience? There's Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kira Webber-Gray, and I'm Philadelphia. Hennigan? Hennigan? I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I love what you talked about in your experience as a, as a defender. And I think when we're talking about all the support we have right now for reform, um, I think there are some people that are left out in terms of who needs to change their mentality as well. And that could be the people who are representing these young children. Um, oftentimes, I know I hear from many uh, lawyers that their job is to represent the facts and to get the uh, most, least amount of time that could go into this kid's disposition. And um, now that I've been, you know, listening to a lot of discussions and been uh, looking at things on a more macro level, I realize that that's not the best approach for a defense counsel. So I just wanted to know, what, what are we doing to inform people who are charged with the responsibility of representing youth to change their mentality as well to go along with the support that we seem to have right now? I'm convinced that was a planted question. <laughs> uh, this is absolutely one of you know my personal life missions, and I got to give a shout out to the National Juvenile Defender Center uh, Executive Director Marianne Scali is in the room. Um, a part of what we are doing is. Um, developing nationwide training curriculums and holding trainings all across the country, both in urban areas and rural areas, designed specifically to address the concerns that you raise. Um, some of the very specific uh, trainings that speak to this are one, this notion of holistic advocacy. I was sort of raised up in the DC Public Defender Service where that's where we were trained from the beginning. But for public defender offices that don't have the same set of resources, we are uh, going across the country and having uh, national conversations about how to help provide resources and training and technical assistance and support for defenders who, who need to learn how to do holistic advocacy. So our um, holistic advocacy includes bringing in trainers like uh, Jen Wooler to, to train on adolescent development, uh, to train on uh, post-disposition advocacy so when kids are in detention facilities we can do better, collateral consequences, um, school discipline, I mean the training curriculum is full. Second thing that I would say in that training curriculum is this notion of implicit racial bias. That came up. Defenders also have implicit racial bias and in fact we are arguably more vulnerable to it than other folks because we look at folks, that's right, we look at, we look at folks and we say um, they're biased and I am not because I am on the side of the kids when the reality is we are just as complicit in the, the racial disparities and in fact can be active um, in perpetuating those racial disparities. And then the third thing I'll say is notwithstanding the importance of holistic advocacy and the like, it is critical that we remember two things. One is due process and expressed interest of the child. And those are not incompatible. Um, that you can be a zealous trial lawyer 
um, fighting for your kids to get your kids out of the system, but at the same time be at the table um, and, and help the child achieve or, or obtain social services in the relevant continuum. So um, I will say DOJ has been phenomenal. Like Carl said, I have to say, you know, thank you to Bob Listenby. Uh, our Georgetown, the Juvenile Justice Clinic, is one of the recipients of uh, one of the Smart One Juvenile Justice uh, 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 Awards for the Mid Atlantic region. And it's I, I say thank you to say thank you and to encourage you to give us even more resources. <laughs> not just me, <laughs> you know, not just, uh, not just Georgetown, but uh, all of the defenders who need that, so we can do the kind of work that needs to be done to raise a level of advocacy for children uh, in the in the juvenile justice system. So, everyone, join me in thanking this incredible. incredible to bring up uh, the Assistant Attorney General uh, for the Office of Justice Programs here at the U.S. Department of Justice, Carol Mason, a tremendous partner who has some family roots in public health, so we are kindred spirits in that regard as well. Uh, she has been a tremendous, tremendous leader and champion uh, to provide us with some closing remarks and thoughts and steps forward. Wasn't she a fabulous moderator? Absolutely. It's amazing. And I want to thank our panelists and everybody that came here today. And um, I'm going to thank Vinny and Patrick as well for their relentless passion about this issue. Uh, Patrick doesn't know this, but one of the when I was a deputy associate attorney general before I had this job, I heard him talk on this issue, and it stuck with me. And so Vinny knows because he, you know, I saw this paper as it was um, evolving. Um, they wanted some convening to talk about this issue, to raise the profile of this issue. And I think you all know that I only have a few more months left in this job, and I keep my promises. We were going to elevate this issue. And I know that we're in a room of the converted, but, um, but I hope that at, through this conversation that you came away with new tools, new partners, and a new vigor to continue this work because uh, as I say, my tenure is oh, coming to an end, but I'm still going to be working on these issues and still counting on you all to continue, as they say, to raise your voices. Because no matter who has my seat, you need to be demanding things from him or her. It does work. Continued, relentless pushing on us works. Because we, and, and I say that, I mean, I mean that positively, because there are issues and things that we have done in this administration because people on this panel, people like Patrick and Benny, have continued to talk to us, talk to us, talk to us. The, the, the fact that we talk about brain science and brain development on a regular basis is because of them. And, it, and, and it's changing the dialogue for everyone. So I want to encourage you all to keep doing this work um, and keep pushing hard because it's important work. It's important that you continue to say that there are new ways to do this. There are new ways. It's not new. I'm calling it new. It's not new. And, and as Theron, who's hiding back there, likes to say, my chief of staff, um, we know what to do. The question is whether we have the will to do it. And I think that with all of you folks in this room, you're demonstrating that we have the will to do it. And I have every confidence in your persuasive ability to go out and persuade those who are not in this room of what it is they should be doing. So I just want to thank you for giving us your morning, giving us your time, and to thank you for the work that you're going to continue to do to make sure we see this change happen. And I know I'm not supposed to say this. I'm not a, am I on film? They give me a script that I don't use, and, and, they, um, and um, I am close to the end of my tenure. Um, and my First Amendment rights will be restored shortly. Um, but in the interim, um, we know what we need to do to make sure that we put our young people on a healthy path to development. We had earlier this week, we had the rollout of our, rollout of our Changing Minds Now campaign. Several of you were there for that. We got the tools. Go to changingminds.org. We know the impact of trauma on kids. We know what kids need to be successful. We know, based on the research, I'm basing on the research, we know that our current juvenile justice system does not work. It doesn't work. So let's go out and create something that does work. And I believe in you all to do that. So thank you for all that you're doing and will do.